All right, cyclohexane. Recall from the last video that cyclohexane is one of our most stable cyclic systems. And the reason is, is because when you make cyclohexane, you will see that here it is right there. Here's our cyclohexane. Here's our six carbons, but it looks a little wonky this way. It It's not flat at all. When we turn it on its side, you can see, oh, check this out. This carbon here is up. We kind of have four carbons in a plane, and then this carbon over here is down. It's totally puckered in shape. And some said, hey, we need to call this shape something obvious. And so someone said, yeah, to me it looks like a chair, where you're like this is the tall back of the chair, here's the seat, and here's like where your legs go down. Kind of like a chaise lounge or something like that. Anyway, they, we call this the chair conformation of cyclohexane, and that is what it normally looks like. Normally, a cyclohexane will adopt this chair structure. Okay, an interesting thing about it, if you look at it, okay, it looks like a chair here. I can rotate it just a little bit and then flip it over, and then there's the chair again. I can just rotate it like this, because can you see that, okay, here's the up one, here's the down one, but I can rotate it to make this one right here the up one, and bing, there is the chair again. All right, so this chair conformation, cyclohexane just adopts this chair conformation. And in doing so, what we find is that when we look at this chair, you'll see that six of the hydrogens are either straight up or this one, or straight down. This one's straight up, the next one is straight down. On the next carbon, it's straight up. On the next carbon, it's straight down. On the next carbon in the ring, it's straight up. And on the next carbon, it's straight down. We call these the axial hydrogens. The six straight, three straight up and three straight down make six axial hydrogens. And the other six hydrogens are equatorial. They are kind of sticking straight out. Not exactly, but kind of straight out from the carbon, like on the equator. Equatorial here, equatorial here. Note, each carbon has an axial hydrogen going straight up or down, and an equatorial. So this carbon here, axial down, equatorial out. The next carbon, axial up, equatorial out. The next carbon, axial down, equatorial out. All right. Now, this, and if you're doing the Newman projection, it, you can draw cyclohexane like this. And when you do, what you notice, let's look at this. When we look at our dihedral angles, oh, check this out. I'm going to take this carbon and line it up with this carbon right here. Note, we have 60-degree dihedral angles. This is totally totally standard. There's no eclipsing at all in this. And when I line up the next two carbons, oop, check this out. Two carbons lined up, totally eclipsing. I rotate it to line the next two carbons, totally eclipsing again. All of the hydrogens are totally eclipsing. No matter how we line this up, everything is in, or excuse me, it's staggered. Blah, everything is staggered, not eclipsing. Everything is staggered. Staggered here. Staggered here. Everything is completely staggered around the whole ring. It's always in this staggered conformation. Since there's, they're all staggered, there's no eclipsing. That means we have no torsional strain. It turns out when you measure the angles, all of the angles are 109.5. Even the angles in the ring are 109.5 which means we have no angle strain. Everything is staggered, so no, no torsional strain. All angles are 109.5, so no angle strain, which means cyclohexane has no ring strain. No ring strain means it's a very stable molecule. However, it still can move around. Um, now, the thing about rings is Rings are very similar to double bonds in that they prevent free rotation. It, build your models, and you will see that when you have a ring, you can't really rotate. 
And if I want to take this carbon right here and just spin it around, I could start to spin it, but uh, note how it makes the ring go a little crazy. But I could only get it to here, and then it will not go anymore. If I try going back the other way, I can spin it down like this, but it won't, it won't spin round and round like that. But it can do this. And this is a confirmation when we look at it from the side where instead of one carbon up having four flat and one down, we have one carbon up back here, four flat, and the other carbon up again. This is called the boat confirmation because someone said it looked like a boat. Okay, fine. Two things that happen in the boat conformation. One is what we call a flagpole interaction. This hydrogen here and this hydrogen here, the two at the top carbons of the boat, get awful darn close to each other, so there's some hindrance there. Plus, when we look down this way, can we see that we've got eclipsing hydrogens on this side and eclipsing on this side? So the boat conformation gives us some Portional strain here due to eclipsing, and we also have this steric hindrance with this flagpole interaction by these two right here getting close to each other. So the boat conformation is much less stable, but the truth is cyclohexane is always doing this. When it's in, so, when it's in solution, it's just, it's, we call it ring flipping. It's always flipping from this to this and stuff like that always doing this type of thing. We just can't spin them around. And let's put it back in the chair because that's where it wants to be in our chair confirmation. All right. Now, if we were to do the diagram, the energy diagram of this ring flipping, you would find it looks like this. And there's a couple of, there's the half chair confirmation, the twist or twist boat conformation, the boat, the twist, the half chair. It goes through all this. But at any given moment, 99% of the molecules are in the chair conformation. It's the lowest energy conformation of cyclohexane. So they're all in the chair. Now, when you get to higher cycloalkanes, like cycloheptane, uh, you can start getting some torsional strain, but no angle strain. Uh, cycloheptane then is less stable than cyclohexane. So very important. Cyclopropane, three carbon cyclopropane, very unstable. Cyclobutane, a little bit more stable, but not much. Cyclopentane, a lot more stable. Cyclohexane, very stable. Cycloheptane, less stable than cyclohexane. Cyclooctane isn't as stable. Once you get to like 10 to 12 carbons, though, in your ring, there aren't many molecules like that. When you get to 10 or 12 molecules in your ring, then you don't worry about angle strain or that much because they can always find a confirmation that's fairly stable. Okay. And occasionally people want to do something, make cat names, where you take two rings and wrap them around each other. You must have at least 18 carbons in the ring to get something to go through there because the hole in the ring is just not big enough. Here's the problem again with these molecules. It looks like the center of this ring is pretty darn big. Looks like you could put a big molecule through the center. The truth of the matter is when you look at the actual correct size of the atoms themselves and how they bond, you cannot even fit a hydrogen atom through the center of a cyclohexane. The center hole in a cyclohexane donut is too small to even fit a hydrogen through when you look at actual size of the molecules and atoms. All right, cool. Now, something kind of interesting happens when we do this ring flipping. Let's take uh, some colored substituents here, uh, red and blue, and see how this hydrogen here is coming straight up? It's axial up. I'm going to put the blue guy right on top of that axial up. And let's see. Uh, okay, can we see how this one is sticking out? We've got the axial down one here, so this one is sticking out. I'm going to take off this hydrogen and put the red one uh, equ equatorial out. So 
Now we have the blue one is, if we look at our chair, the blue one is axial up, the red one is equatorial out. No matter how I turn it, the blue one is axial up, the red one is equatorial out. If I ring flip this, look what happens though. I'm just going to take any two of the carbons opposite each other to ring flip it. Remember, blue is axial up. When I ring flip it, this one goes up like that, that one goes down. Look what happens. The red one is now axial up, and the blue one is equatorial out. Make your models. Do your ring flipping. You will see that no matter what two carbons you want to ring flip, hey, I'll ring flip this carbon here and this one, these two. The one that contains the blue, flip that one up. The one opposite, flip one down. I'm back to the chair. Now blue is back to being axial up. Red is back to axial or equatorial out. Ring flip it. Now blue is equatorial out and red is axial up. Ring flipping changes axial to equatorial. All right. Now, what would happen, though, if we then say, okay, let's put some more substituents on this benz or excuse me, on this ring. What would happen if I put a methyl group on here? So now I'm just going to take my cyclohexane here in the chair confirmation and put a methyl group sticking out. So here's my cyclohexane and my methyl group sticking out right here. And this works just fine. This methyl group can turn. There's no problems here. But note that the methyl group is equatorial out. Here's my three axials down. This is equatorial out. Because if we look at this carbon here, remember each carbon has one axial and one equatorial. This has axial down, so here's equatorial out. Uh, yeah, and so this works just fine. But if we ring flip this, recall if this is equatorial out and we ring flip it, it's going to become axial. And now it is axial up. And these models don't show it too well, but it turns out with this one axial up, the hydrogens on the methyl group, these, uh, these hydrogens on the methyl group here are awful darn close to these hydrogens on the ring. If I turn it this way, this hydrogen of the methyl group and these two axial hydrogens on carbons we call the methyl group on carbon 1, this would be carbon 2 and carbon 3, this 1-3 diaxial interaction between the methyl group and these two guys, uh, call them steric hindrance. So that means that the methyl group being equatorial at any given time, you'll find the substituent equatorial and only 5% of the time will that methyl group be uh, axial. It will still go through. It'll ring flip. It'll still be equatorial, equatorial. It'll ring flip axial and then fairly quickly ring flip back equatorial because the methyl group being axial is a less stable configuration. It's higher in energy. Okay. So that's just a very general thing to remember, that substituents want to go equatorial. If at all possible, a, substi a substituent wants to be equatorial on a ring, a cyclohexane ring. Uh, it's so necessary that if you're looking at a tert-butyl group, a tert-butyl group, and if you build your models, build a tert-butyl group and see how large it is. I don't have enough carbons here, but a tert-butyl group is roughly the size of a cyclohexane. You build a four-carbon four tert-butyl group, you'll find it's roughly the same size as a cyclohexane ring. Tert-butyl groups are huge. They're monsters. And it turns out that a tert-butyl group can't even quite go axial. There's so much steric hindrance that it can't quite get all the way up to the axial position. So 99.99% of the time, the tert-butyl group is going to be equatorial. And that's something we find. The larger the group is, the more likely it is to find it equatorial. Okay. 
Well, that was fun. What if we have some die substituted cycloalkanes? What if we put two groups on there? Well, a few things to note. If we have die substituted cycloalkanes, note that you can't uh, rotate all these carbons. You can't rotate it. So if you have this, here's a cyclopropane with the methyl group down, and this methyl group is also down. Recall, recall with cyclopropane, everything is eclipsed. There's no way to make this methyl go up and this one down. They are locked in this configuration. So you cannot convert this one to this one because this one has a methyl group opposite. So this is actually the cis isomer of 1,2-dimethyl cyclopropane, and this is the trans isomer. And it turns out with all of our rings, we cannot convert cis to trans. Even with our cyclohexanes, we can't do it. So if I were to take a, let's see, let's, let's, let's make this easier because those methyl groups are going to be a little hard to see in the video. So I'm just going to use the red guy and the blue guy again. I think they are going to prove easier to see. So note what I'm doing here is I'm going to put the red guy and the blue guy both axial but opposite each other. So here's our, I'm going to put this guy, the cyclohexane on its side. Here's our chair. Note that the red is axial up, the blue is axial down. And also note that, is this the most stable conformation? The answer is no, it's definitely not the most stable conformation. But before we go to more stable, my question, is this cis or trans? Well, I think we can see here's our ring. Here's the, here's the plane of the ring right here. Here's the plane of the ring. And we can see that the red is above the ring and the blue is below the ring. They are on opposite sides. So just when you're talking as with cis and trans molecules, double bonds, you draw a line through the double bond or down along the double bond and see if the hydrogens are on opposite sides. Just like this, you draw a line along the ring, and we note that these two groups are on opposite sides of a line going down the ring. Therefore, these are trans. This is the trans isomer. But as we said, it is not the most stable because those two are axial. If we ring flip equatorial, it now looks like this. And it's a little tough to see because they are both now equatorial, but if we draw a line through the ring, they are still on opposite sides. I draw a line, here's the carbon, this carbon containing the red, this carbon here contains the blue. If I draw a line between those two carbons, we still see the red and blue are on opposite sides of that line. Is still the trans. Ring flipping does not change cis to trans. It changes axial to equatorial, but it does not change cis into trans. Okay, cool. Let's see what else. Um, the problem though is how do we draw this? Because we can draw it in our chair conformation. Here's our chair here, um, and I ring flipped it and it became this. But an easier way, what people often draw it, is something like this. When they say, okay, let's look at it this way. Let's draw a cyclohexane. And so for this one over here, if we draw a cyclohexane, there's our cyclohexane right here. And if I want to indicate that these two are trans, I can just say, okay, one of these is coming out towards us and the other is going back. And this is a great way to see that, oh, it's trans because this one's coming out, this one's going back, obviously trans. 
this down here is obviously cis because if this is our ring and they're both coming out towards us, they must both be on the same side. You need to be able to having to see this trans in the chair and draw this diagram or see this diagram and draw the trans in the chair. Uh, my suggestion to you, the way I do it, you can do it however you want, but the way I do it is I take, okay, here's this one, and it's coming out. I always then will draw my chair with this carbon here being the up carbon and the one coming towards me axial. So if I see this part of a cyclohexane with a carbon with something coming out towards me, I make this carbon the up carbon and the thing coming out axial. And then I can figure out how to do it. Because recall, whenever you've got this here, this carbon is um, up and out, axial up and out. What's on the next carbon? Axial down and out. This carbon, axial up and out. Remember that, up and out, down and out, up and out, down and out for axial. All right. So here is the cis molecule. Can we see that it is cis? Because if we were to draw a line through the two carbons, note that both of these methyl groups here are on the same side of this line. If we took our molecule over here, I'll just switch these up. And check this out. We can see that the blue one is up. Oh. This blue one is up, so it's axial, and the red one is out this way, so it is equatorial. And that's our trans molecule, or it's our cis molecule, because note, uh, here's the carbon containing the blue one, here's the carbon containing the red one, draw a line between those two carbons, and the red and the blue are on the same side, so it is cis. Okay, cool. Uh, note though, this red one is equatorial, as all substituents want to be equatorial. This blue substituent, uh, substituent is axial. What would happen if we ring flip this? Well, recall, if we ring flip it, the blue that is axial after ring flipping, bong becomes equatorial, and the red equatorial becomes axial. So if these were two methyl groups and one was equatorial and the other was axial, ring flipping it won't change that. If these were both methyl groups, okay, this one's, ac this one's equatorial, this one's ax axial, ring flip, I still have one equatorial and one axial. There's no way to get both of them equatorial. Now, one could say, well, what about a boat? What if we did this boat? Yeah, here's a boat, and then they're both equatorial in the boat. They are, but recall the boat has all this other strain here. The boat has all this torsional strain due to eclipsing. So it'll never be the boat. It'll only be the chair. And so if you have a cis 1,4-dimethyl cyclohexane, you can only have one CH3 axial, one equatorial, and ring flipping won't change that. Okay. Ooh, but what if it were, say, one three? What about one two? What would ring flipping do? That's, that's a good question. I highly suggest you get some models and you build it, or even after you've done that, uh, draw it out. See if you can draw what it should be like. See if you can say, okay, I'm going to take the trans 1,3 here and see if I can draw it in this configuration and figure out if it's chair or boat or what the deal is with that. All right. Uh, for some reason, they always throw this in this chapter, and I don't know why. Uh, oxidation. Uh yeah, it turns out, our first look at oxidation here, that if you have a just a normal alkane, it can get oxidized, not very easily, but it can get oxidized to an alcohol. And then alcohols cannot get oxidized to aldehydes or ketones. 
which can get oxidized. The aldehyde can get oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Ketones, actually, it's very difficult to oxidize them. But oxidation means adding oxygen. Recall from Gen Chem 1 and 2, it was increasing positive charge. Uh, you increase positive charge by adding electronegative oxygen, which increases the positive charge on the carbon due to polarity different polarity electronegativity differences. We'll worry about that in chapter 12, but as an introduction, the CH3, CH3 alkanes are the most reduced form of hydrocarbon. Oxi put an oxygen on there, one oxygen. This carbon has one oxygen, so this has been oxidized. This carbon has double bond to an oxygen, so it's even more oxidized than a single bond. Just like a ketone is double bonded to an oxygen, it's more oxidized than an alcohol. Carboxylic acid and esters have one, two, three, three bonds to oxygen, so they are more oxidized than aldehydes or ketones. And the most oxidized you can get is carbon dioxide. Four bonds to oxygen, a double bond to one oxygen, a double bond to the other oxygen. When we get into chapter 12, we will discuss how to go basically from here to here, here, uh, alcohols to carboxylic acids and back again. Because it turns out that's not the easiest thing to do. That took a little bit of uh, work to figure that out. Taking any of these molecules, taking an alcohol or uh, ethane here and converting it to carbon dioxide is very easy. You just burn it, burn it in air and you'll convert any, almost all organic compounds to carbon dioxide. The question is, how do you not go all the way to carbon dioxide? How do you stop at an aldehyde? How do you stop at a carboxylic acid? That's what chapter 12 is all about. But this is now the end of chapter 4. Chapter 4 is kind of a beast. It was a long chapter. And I don't know how you'll feel about this, but now we're going to go on to chapter 5, stereochemistry, and that's probably going to freak you out a little bit, blow your mind. But we'll get there in the next video.